you know, very similar. People are people. You say, oh, that's a grand statement. People are people. But generally, people are similar in so many ways. And we have a desire, we have a desire to be first. Anybody agree with that statement? We have a desire to be first. You ever thought about getting on a plane? I want to be first. I don't want the hustle and the bustle of trying to get on the plane, you know. You're waiting for a taxi, you know, at an airport or wherever it may be, and there's a line of taxis, but there's people waiting, but you wish you could just jump the queue and be first because you are more important than everybody else. Is that right? Yeah? What about, you know, when you get to the restaurant and you've been, you've ordered your meal and people come in after you and you see they get their food and you're saying, huh, huh, what's going on here? I was first. Anybody experience that mo- moment in life? I have many times. And if it has happened to me, it's happened to you. And if, it, and if it's happened in the past, it will happen in the future because we have a, a desire to be first. You know, sometimes we are first, you know, we rejoice in that. Wow. You know. But other times we're not first. You know, today I was first in the building by a long shot. And uh, I was happy about being first in the building. But, you know, then there was a second and there was a third. And none of them were actually bad in any way. They were all good. Is that right? Praise God. But a desire to be first is very normal. You know, they have done scientific studies. And now science is telling us something we already knew, that the basic character of humanity is to be first. People, they can't explain why, and, uh, but we can. You know, wanting to be first is selfish. It's selfishness, and that's what it is. We're putting self ahead of everybody else, and even if I say God. So by nature, we are selfish. Now, where did that come from? You know, if, uh, if you've got babies, hang on to them, because I'm about to say something about babies. But we've all been babies at some time. Even the oldest people have been babies when you were little babies. I remember, you know, in my lifetime, I remember seeing some of the things I'm saying quite clearly. I don't remember doing them, but I might have, you know. You ever, ever seen a parent take a child into a shopping center, and the child sees and the child wants? Yeah? Ever seen what a baby does or a child that can just wants that? Anybody? I'm going to ask somebody to demonstrate for me what a child does. Oh, who, is, who is that person? There's a word of knowledge. Who is that person? You know what a baby does. You're going to come up on stage. Somebody, I need a, I need a volunteer. If, you, uh, if Isaiah doesn't move and you beat him, you'll get his reward. Is there, is there somebody who can show me what a baby does? Just way, just right there. Show me what a baby does when they want something. You can, no, I don't want you to get on anything except what you know a baby will do. Ultimately, when they've lost it all, what are they going to do? And when they don't get it at that point, what do they do? No, they don't. No, they don't pull their hair out. You haven't been around long enough. They lie on their back and kick their arms and feet in the ground. And they... Is that right? Give Sonny a big hand. Babies throw tantrums. And, you know, mum and dad never stopped to teach them how to be selfish. Nobody said, now sit down. When you don't get what you want, I want you to scream. I want you to shout. Shout loud. Come on, shout. You're not shouting. No one teaches babies how to be selfish. They have it built in when they're born, you know. I've seen our own babies coming home and doing things that I couldn't believe they were doing at a week old, you know, like face red as red and screaming with all power. But so have everyone in this room done the same because it's in us, resistance against the parents, you know, from birth. It's a crazy thing, but we're, it is intrinsically the nature of hu- fallen humanity, and God redeemed us by the, by the blood of Jesus Christ to change us into the image of his son. And his son isn't like that. His son is fully compliant to Father God, whatever you want. 
you know, not my will be done, but your, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven, the will of God is being done, and on earth it needs to be done. And Jesus wasn't the tantrum-throwing child, whether baby or right through the growing ages, right until ultimately facing the cross at the age of 33. He didn't fight the cross. You know, he actually sweated great drops of blood knowing the agony, knowing that the, the path that he had to endure was going to be something horrific. But he knew without it, none of us would be saved. The Lamb of God, there's only one Lamb of God. Before that, there were lambs being slaughtered all over you know, uh, Israel in particular, and blood was being shed. But the shedding of the blood of an animal will never cleanse away the, the sin of a human being. There was a token gesture until the Lamb of God came, the fulfillment of the one who would fill all of the prophetic pictures of the blood of the Lamb. It's the blood, it's the blood, it's the blood that sets you free. Hallelujah. Here's some, uh, you know, survey says. Anybody wants a survey said? Survey says, well, do you want me to? No, I'll, I'll just hang on to that for a second. As far as the genders go, men and women, they're a bit different. You know, when the surveys were done, it says that men were more likely to be self, more selfish than women, just generally speaking. Okay? So all the women laughed, and that's okay. Men are wired in God for the, the breadwinner going out, getting the food, bringing it home. That's what men are wired for. So they're wired for, you know, self-preservation, my family, me, and I'll fight anyone who tries to stop it. You know, that sort of thing. But women are less selfish because they are the nurturers who help others to survive. You catch what I'm saying? If the mother's got food for her kids and not for herself, she'll feed her kids before she feeds herself. Anybody, any mothers in the room? Yeah. So it's just the way we're wired, but we're wired by God. And, uh, but nevertheless, both men and women are still selfish. You know, the part of the proof of, uh, you know, if you want to, we talked about men, we can talk about, you know, what about the seats on a plane? You know, let's go there. When you want to get on a seat on a plane, do you want to get on the aisle seat or do you want to get on the window seat? Window. You know, most men will say window. And second to that will be aisle. Anybody window? Who's the window people? I'm a window person. They say that the window people are more selfish than the aisle people. <laughs> Precious Lord. You know, and men, talking about men, we're giving men a bit of a hard time, but just wait for the ladies shortly. <laughs> men who go to the gym are more likely to be selfish <laughs> because it's about them. It's about, it's about... You know all that stuff? Presentation. It's about me. But if you have a man that goes to the gym and wants to sit at the window, ladies, beware. <laughs> Precious Lord. That's sort of marriage stuff. We should do counselling just about there. <laughs> the only place they found women really, really got like full on with this selfishness was when they put a, a cake on the table and a chocolate cake at that and they cut it into, you know, the, the pieces. But you know how people, I'm, I'm pretty meticulous, I like to cut everything exactly even. I do it in half, I do it in quarters, I do it in eighths, I, do, I go to trouble to make sure that they're equal. But women generally don't do that very often. They just cut it, ready to eat. And if a woman has an opportunity to pick the piece she wants, she will always, the first one will pick the biggest piece first. Any women say they believe that they get the biggest, that's you? Yeah. Any other women who pick the biggest piece? Oh my goodness me. There's some truth in it, but not all, eh? Praise God. You know, in the world there's two types of people, those who hold back and those who give without holding back. You can hold back. From giving, you can be very tight in everything is mine, mine, mine. You know, children at, at school do mine. It's mine. You know that story? They, who taught them that? Nobody sat and taught the children, it's mine. And fight, the, knock them down if they get near you, trying to take your toy. 
Precious Lord. So there are those who hold back and those who give without holding back. It's just two types of people. And the one type is the, you know, you may be saved but have not been changed by God. And the other one is those who give without holding back are those who become more and more in the image of Christ. And it's not like an event, it's a process. Most people change gradually. More and more like Jesus, you know, we sing songs about that. And then when the opportunity comes, <laughs> we dig in. So we are changed progressively by God. So there are three mindsets in all, in actual fact. There are two types of people, but three different mindsets, and we're just going to go through them briefly today. The bag mindset, remember the word first throughout this message. Who is first? You, God, or the devil, or whatever else, or your money, or, or your goods. You know, the bag mindset is never enough. Now, you know, I've got to tell you that it, I have a memory when I preached the message over here, I remember it, the Spirit of God just came in a beautiful manner and uh, it was energy in the church and energy in the building, but it was to do with Moses leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. And I remember saying as they slogged in the mud and they were making bricks for Pharaoh, what nobody realized was their calves were getting bigger and bigger. Is that right? Where's Georgie, the biggest calves in the house? Their calves, Georgie, were getting bigger and bigger, come more big. They were getting ready for the exodus out of the land of not enough, walking through the Sinai Desert, the land of just enough, and going through to the promised land of more than enough. You know, that message has changed my life. I'm preaching it over here, but I can tell you that it changed me. I have never, and I don't think I'll ever forget those words. There was such, something happened that day that was uh, unforgettable, life-changing. And this, I think, parallels in a different way today to that day. So this is the bag mindset is never enough. You know, and uh, in... In Haggai chapter 1, verse 6, it says, You have sown much, bring in little. You eat, but don't have enough. You drink, but are not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but you're not warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes in it. So you can earn, there's people earning big money who still don't have enough. Do you believe that? So some people say, if I can only earn some more money, then I'll have enough. But most people have got a pattern in their lives where they always spend, they say the average is about 10% more than they earn. So if you keep spending 10% more than you earn, you're going to always be in the land of not enough. You're never going to have enough. And so it's important to change what we do. Judas also carried the bag. You remember Judas in the New Testament in Mark 14, verse 3 to 9? You know, there was a story, verse 3, and being in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman, everybody say, a woman. Uh, not very enthusiastic. Say, a woman. You know, she wasn't apparently of good character. A woman with not good character. They could have put it there, but the writers chose not to, I believe, for good reason because she's no longer the woman she used to be. She's transformed by the personality, the blood that's coming and days to come, not far, by the blood of the one whom she's anointing. She's already met and impacted by what he said and what he did. And there was a woman came having an alabaster flask of very costly oil of spikenard, and then she broke the flask and poured it on his head. Now, I don't know how, what you think about this, but I think that's extraordinary. And I'll tell you why it's extraordinary. It's coming up. But there were some. So it wasn't, I want you to take note when it says there were some, not one, because we're going to be focused on one, but there were some. So there was a number of the disciples, we at least assume, because they were all there, and maybe others, who were indignant, angry, upset, call it what you like, among themselves, and they were saying to each other, and then maybe more loudly and publicly, why was this fragrant oil wasted? For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor, and they criticized her sharply. 
didn't turn on Jesus and say, Jesus, why did you let her do this? They turned on her and criticized her sharply. Now, the 300 denarii, you know, is like a year's wages or something of that nature in that day. Today, it could be, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80,000, 100,000 dollars income equivalent. Now, you say, man, that's an expensive bottle of oil. For it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii, given to the poor. So the whole thing was it could have been sold and given to the poor. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a good work for me. You know, for me, she did something of a revelation. She put Jesus first. Oh, but there's poor people. Yep, the poor are always going to be there. You need to help the poor. But this is a moment in time that uh, she's done an amazing thing for me. For you have the poor with you always. That's never going to go away. It hasn't gone away in 2,000 years. And whenever you, w- whatever, whenever you wish, you may do them good. He, said, he didn't say, don't, no, forget it. That's not worth doing anymore. Help the poor. But me, you do not have always. And she, she has done what she could. I want you to take note of that. She has done what she could. In other words, she couldn't have done more. This was... In those days, the saving, you know, they didn't have banks, money as we, they did have banks, but not most people didn't put money in there. And other people had ways of saving and this oil, she might have bought like a drop at a time because this is super, super, super expensive oil. She might have brought the smallest, a gram or two. She added to it through her illicit lifestyle of payment and money she made, she bought and she was saving up her superannuation perhaps, her health bills that were gonna come for sure. You know, there's problems that she was thinking about, but at some point she changed her mind. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what, and she's put Jesus first, extravagant generosity, she gave it all, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to wherever this gospel, you know, the gospel has gone to every corner of the world. There's no place the gospel hasn't gone if there is, it's like, like 0.0111% or something like that. It's, the world has been saturated, and yes, we must keep going, and we must keep preaching. But her, this gospel, he said, this, what she has done, everywhere the gospel gets preached, she's going to be mentioned. We're doing it today. She's got a mention in Scripture. This woman, whatever she's done, will be told as a memorial to her. You know, we had uh, Judas also had a bag mindset. He had a problem in his life. He was one of those people who was uh, challenging what was being done. In John chapter 12, verse 6, it says, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box or bag, depending on the translation, and he used to take what was put in it. He would steal from the ministry. He had a mindset of this place over here, the land of not enough. He was brought up in the land of not enough. He was ingrained with not enough. And you take what you can and you hoard what you can. And you, you know, he must have had some place he was hoarding this. Just that woman had gathered in her unsafe state for her future. But Judas is stealing to hoard up somewhere. We, no, one, no details are ever given to us, but we know that he was constantly, it says, his hand was in the bag. Now, he was trusted to carry the money of the ministry, but somewhere he had a wrong heart. Something was wrong with his heart and so on. And, you know, so he didn't care for the poor. It's not long after this moment that Judas goes and betrays Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know, that's, uh, that was what his heart was like. Let's betray Jesus, you know, for money, because he wanted more. He had already taken money. He wanted her to sell the oil, put the money in the bag that he carried, so he could take some more out of the bag, so he could store some more up for a rainy day. We don't know whether he was giving it to his mother, his father, his brothers, his sisters, his uncles and aunts, or was he putting in his own Savings account. We don't know what he was doing, but we know from the scriptures that his hand was in the bag. He had opportunity. He watched the man that nobody else had the opportunity could 
teach them how to walk out of the land of not enough into the land of just enough, into the land of more than enough. He saw with his own eyes, he heard with his own ears the testimonies of when he fed the five thousand. Oh, he, more than enough. Oh, I, he should have, somewhere the revelation should have come, but it never came. So number two, you know, the first one was the bag. The second one is the basket mindset, putting Jesus first in every situation. In Deuteronomy 28.2, it says, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Now, the voice of the Lord your God can be taken as hearing his voice. And you still need to, I believe, getting the Bible is not enough. You say, well, wow, that's a strong statement. Because the Bible was written by the Holy Spirit inspiring people to write what they wrote. And I still need the Holy Spirit when I read the word. I still need the Holy Spirit. You know, when we say, God said, well, the voice of the Lord your God, God said. He said it to Moses, and these were written down in the first five books, and so on. So the voice of God is in its written form, but the Spirit gives it life. The Word of God tells us about this very topic, that the, the letter, that's the written word without the Spirit, the letter kills it's dull, it's boring, there's no revelation. I can't get any, I've seen people say, I've read the Bible, I've got nothing out of it. I said, the letter will kill, but the Spirit gives life. And you need to invite the Holy Spirit, the one who wrote the book in the first place, to say, please come and help me understand what you wrote in the first place. And uh, so, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. You know, if you haven't been overtaken by the blessings, then go back to the Word of God and say, God, I'm, I probably need a bit more understanding, but I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to open my Word and I'm going to read and I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to help me understand how this kingdom operates. See, it's an invisible kingdom. The visible is what we see. The, you know, the, you open the news and every night, you know, not every night, it's probably on 10 times, 50 times a day, the stock market went up 2%. This company fell. Oil went up. Gold went down. And you see the markets of the world and your eyes can feast on that, especially if you're right in it and you've got stocks and shares and you've got investments in gold and silver and oil. And you can say, oh, I've just lost you know, some money. Oh, I've just made some. And we sort of get, can get hooked up with this world system, which we are living in and we need to be, hear me, we are a part of in various ways but our trust cannot be in the system of the world. We are in it, Bible says, but we are not of it. Why are we not of it? Because we have somebody, something that we're looking to that other people can't see. Our eyes are fixed upon the author and the finisher of our faith, not upon the TV, not upon the economic news, not upon the inflation rate, unemployment rate. You know, are the houses going up? Yeah, oh, they're going up right there. They're starting to move upwards. There's a housing shortage, a rental crisis, 100 people lining up for one house to rent. They are real things that you face in real life. And we know people who have been through this just now in recent times. So that's the real world we live in. But our trust is in the one that saved us. He is the one who opens the door to get a house, buy a house, rent a house, whatever it may be. It's God who makes a way when there seems to be no way, and the blessings will overtake you. Praise God. Deuteronomy 28 verse 5 says, Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Your basket, we talked about the bag, I'm talking about the basket. Your basket is what you carry everything home in. That's the kind of baskets, and I know... Uh, in PNG, there's certain woven baskets. There's bigger baskets, smaller baskets. The more produce you got, come more big. Bigger baskets come. You fill the basket with more stuff, and you take it home. You know, and that's a cultural thing from way back then, but also still in the world in many, many places. In Luke 6:38, it says, "Give and it will be given to you." You notice it doesn't say keep and you will keep. Keep or it'll be given. It says give. It's like a statement from God. Give and it shall be given to you. If you give, it will be given. Number of things. Good measure. Press down. Shaken together. And running over. There you go. It's running over. <laughs> it will be put into your bosom. Bosom is another word for your lap. 
You'll be loaded on your lap. If you're sitting in a seated position, they'll come and load you up. Ever been loaded up where you couldn't say, I can't take all this, is ridiculous. Ever, ever had that? I have. I have. It doesn't matter if it was in three or four bags or one bag or whatever, but it was some loaded up too much for this man to carry, you know. So when it says given, it shall be given, not keep. So good measure. I will tell you where it comes from. The whole thought idea, um, I think the, the place in Ruth, you know, the book of Ruth, it's four chapters, read it, refresh yourself with it. There's a choice to give and a choice to keep. If you keep what you have, this is all you will have. You can keep what you have, but you'll be no different to the world. That's what you've got to remember, and there is no room for miraculous, let alone just blessing. Blessings aren't always miraculous. Miraculous is like if you get some fish and loaves and feed 20,000 people. That's a miraculous. But blessings can come when God opens doors that no man can close and he closes doors that no man can open. And you can't do that for yourself. You can try. You can bash doors. You can try to close doors. I don't want that door. I don't want that door. Or you want to bash that door. But God said, I'm not involved because you're living your life like the rest of the world. You can do that if you want to. But if you give, it's what you give that God will multiply what you, what you give. Praise God. So in Ruth chapter 2, verse 4, now behold, Boaz came from where? Bethlehem and said to the reapers. You know, this stood out to me and I've never seen it before the way I saw it today. I'm going to tell you, I saw this today, early this morning. The Lord be with you, he said to the reapers. And they answered him, and the Lord bless you. Now, Boaz stands as a type in scripture as God. And the reapers is all of us. And he says to us, the, 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 to the reapers, the Lord be with you. You know, who doesn't want to hear those words? The Lord be with you. When you walk out of this place, you want to walk out on your own or you want to hear the words, the Lord be with you. Wherever I go, he goes. Wherever I sit, he sits. Whatever I do, I, you know, he's going to be there. That's the kind of life that he actually planned for us. The Lord be with you. Day and night, morning and evening, through the day, through the night, when you're awake, when you sleep, when you cook, when you wash, when you work, whatever it may be, the, the, may the Lord be with you. Hallelujah. And they answered him and they said, the Lord bless you. You know, which is a type of, we turn our worship towards God. We worship God with our heart, not with our body. Our body, you know, if it wasn't for God, a church would just be a gathering. You know, when they go to a nightclub, Church isn't a nightclub, not saying we ought to be or look like them, but a gathering without God could be a nightclub, could be a, you know, rotary or lions meeting or something like that. It's a meeting where even some places good things happen, they do good things, but there's no God factor in this. But the difference when we come here, it's, it's something that we are giving to God. We're going to come to more of that shortly. But we have an opportunity, it's a point, to worship him. He, says, he blesses the reapers. May the Lord be with you and we send worship up. What, a, what an amazing reciprocal terminology in Scripture. Hallelujah. You know, in the Old Testament, the, the owner who owned the property, let's say this is the farm, a thousand acres or hectares, and the, the, usually the landowner was the wealthier person and there were poorer people in Israel, and that wealthy person employed the poor people, poorer people, to come and harvest the, the crops. And they would do that and do it well. All day the workers toiled steadfastly, carrying their baskets of grain to the storehouse. The owner of the property has a barn, could be like this. And all day long, you know, today we've got big machines at harvest. I don't want to talk about the machines, I want to talk about that day when they were harvesting by hand. They had the sickle and they had to bind the sheaves. They had to then get the seed out of the sheaves and bring the, you know, the trash went outside and the grain went inside. But you know, if you had to do that all day and you've got a basket, you know, maybe let's say 30 or 40 kilos of grain and you're going to carry the sheaves and the basket and you've got to walk a fair distance to go to where the barn is and you got your order and you put it in. You're not going to overload your basket at all. You're going to fill it. You're going to do your job because you've got to go from morning, six in the morning till six in the evening or sunlight. 
you know, break of day to end of day, and you've got to do this all day. So you don't want to overload yourself. It'll probably be a little bit lower than full, because that's normal. But when this scripture was written, it wasn't written in regard to just any old application. It was to do with the next bit, which is really important, I think, is that the, the workers, according to the law of the Lord, the owner was to say, leave the corners of the field, don't harvest them. And they were for the poor. And the poor could go in after the harvesters have done their stuff through the day. They could go into the corners of the field and reap from the corners. The more generous the owner was, the bigger the corners got. The less generous, greedy, you know, not so generous owner, the corner would be just a little tiny corner. Oh my goodness. And the poor people say, oh, he's mean. He, we can't even eat. Like, what's going on? And the corners are either big corners or little corners depending on the generosity. But when you went to get, the poor people went to get their grain, this is what the Word of God was saying to them. If you give your labor full and wholeheartedly to your landlord, if you do for him really well, you, you really, really properly have earned your wages then you give your life and your servitude to him and it will be given to you. And this is he's saying, fill your, when you go to the corners, the corners will be large and generous and you can fill your baskets out of what's been left for you, good measure, press down, you can shake it so it'll settle down, pack it on top again, shaken together and running over. That's what you, you didn't take that full basket to his house but you took it to your house. And it was okay by the boss. That was okay. He said, do what you want. Those corners are yours. So part of the history of that goes, for with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Whatever, whatever generosity is in you, whatever, however you sow generosity, that's how it's going to be sowed to you. About 30 years ago, I remember a preacher preach. It just came flooding back to me. And he gave an illustration, whatever measure. And he described what that was in his life. And how he said, you know, if you if I give with a thimble full, some of people don't know what a thimble full is, but if I give with a thimble full, you know, one thimble to God, God will give you the same measure, the same container. This is not like physical, you know, this is metaphorical. God will use the same measure. You chose the measure, the thimble he might give you 10 thimblefuls and say, well, that's good, but it's not as good as the next person. And he said, There's, he went through the thimble, the spoon, the shovel, the wheelbarrow, he went on to the small truck, to the semi-trailer. He said, you choose the measure. And whatever measure, see, it's all to do with your faith, what you believe in your extravagance of generosity. It's not just about giving to the church. This is about giving in your life. Today we have an opportunity. I just think God set this up. You know, I saw that fridge and I thought, oh, this sort of fits right into the whole message. And, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to overwhelm somebody. You know, you know what I mean, overwhelm? Oh, here's a Coles, Woolworths, IGA bag of groceries. Or oh, we back up a whole youthful. full. We can overwhelm people with generosity. And I'll tell you, there'll be moments in that person's life they will never forget. Ten years time, they say, you know, there was a day when I didn't have any food in my, and this happened in the church and a word was given and, you know, and, and man, and they, I've seen people weep and weep in overwhelmed by the goodness of God. Because we say, you know, I've heard Barry say before, God is good. Is it, did he say that? Did you say that? What else did he say? Did he say, can you remember? I remember God is good. But how good is God that he would work through us in our generosity to see what God does? So Ruth, the book of Ruth is a beautiful picture of the reaping and the sowing and, you know, bless the reapers and worship God. It's all in the pictures of the scriptures 
How beautiful is that? I love it. You know, in the first Kings chapter 17, Elijah and the widow story, a little bit of oil and flour left, you know, and God multiplied what was given. She gave first a little cake to Elijah and the oil and the flour. It's a miracle story. She was picked by God, chosen by God, because God knew that in the midst of a drought and the last little bit that she had, God, I don't know if he could find anyone else who would do what she did because most people say, it's mine. You know that thing, children's stuff? It's mine. And they'll fight kids. I've seen little kids fight like they're going to the heavyweight championship of the world. Knocking each other down. They don't care how hard they fall. They don't care what happens because it's mine. And I don't know whether God in that day would have found anybody else, but he found the widow of Zarephath. He said, this woman, when she's got, she'll be asked and she will do it. Because Elijah said, go home first. She said, we've got one meal left. And when we cook that last cake for us, that's it. Then we're going to die. What a prophecy. Then we're going to die. And instead, God chose to turn it all around. And he said, Give, bake me first. Go and first make a little cake. Not the big cake, your cake, you know. Little cake. Bring me a little cake. And when you bring me the little cake, he said, your oil and flour will not diminish until the rain start and the crops come in. You won't die. You and your son will live. And this is the blessing of God. Praise God. So the little boy with the fish and the bread, 12 baskets left over. He gave, you know, as a young kid, we don't know how old he was, but as a young kid, he gave what he had. Now, I don't know what he was thinking. I would love to know what was in his mind but there was some dynamic there that Jesus, the disciple, Jesus is thinking something. The disciples are thinking something else. And the people are hungry and they're no doubt thinking about, should we just all go now and uh, find food or whatever, because they're all hungry. But there was a dynamic with that little boy picked up, heard the language, got close. And this is a key. He was close enough in, we estimate 20,000 people, men, women and children. And he got close enough. He must have edged up listening to the conversation of the apostles, the disciples, and Jesus. And somewhere he determined in his innocence, well, I haven't got a lot, but I'll give you what I... Here's the fish and the loaves. He gave everything he had. And when they finished gathering up all the bits and pieces, there were 12 baskets, one for every disciple. Doggy bag. And I'm sure they were full. They were full, like everyone else was full. And I'm sure they thought, well, what are we are too full to eat anymore? Why is he giving us a basket of food, bread and fish? And I'm sure they must have mumbled amongst themselves at the abundance of this land of more than enough. All the people ate, the boy ate, the disciples ate, and even when everybody, it says, was full, no, no more, stop, no, can't eat anymore, then he said, gather the fragments. And he ended up with 12 baskets full. Far more than the original giving. That was a miraculous event. Amazing, miraculous event. Number three, last point. You know, the bag, the basket, and the barn. BBB. Barn mindset. Put God first. Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10 Honor the Lord with your possessions or your wealth and with the first fruits of your increase so that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new, with new wine. You know, first is first. Seek first, you know, God. Seek first the kingdom. But this word says, honor the Lord with your possessions. How do you honor him? With the first fruits. It's not the last fruits. Like some people, you know, some people have no understanding on the tithe is a 10%. It literally means equals 10% or 0.1 of the income that we get. And so we understand what that means, but we got to get the revelation that it's not given at the end after I pay all my bills. I do it before I do anything else because it belongs to him, but it also is honoring to him when we honor God with the first fruits of our increase, no matter what it is, no matter where it comes from. Whether you run a business or you've got a job or you're whatever you're doing, you know, you might be dealing in stocks and shares. It doesn't really matter. Seek God at the beginning of the year, beginning of the week, beginning of the day, you know, 
I love that, you know, some people wonder and there's a whole, you know, discourse on what day we should worship. I personally am of the mind, I always have been, that I am a worshipper seven days a week. You know, the Lord desires they that worship to worship in spirit, in the anointing, in spirit and in truth. According, the truth is the Word of God. But we come on a Sunday. Sunday in the calendar is the first day of the week. Saturday always was the last day of the week. But we start the week with worship. We, I don't, this is not accidental. And you can go through the whole Word of God and you look where they began to come together on the first day of the week. The first day of the week. It's just repeated numerous times. It's the new beginning. The, new, the kingdom of God. The church has been birthed. There's something fresh happening on the earth. And as that occurs something new happens. And today what we're doing, coming together, we came together to worship, to take communion. We come to give of our finances. We come to do many things and fellowship and get to spend time with one another. But first, first things first, we worship. Before we did anything, we worship God. And it's how we start the week because we may need to give Him the first fruits of our worship, the first day of the week. You know, in our lives, and I, all I can say is for an allies, Fitra and I, uh, we, de- we determined 40 years ago that we wouldn't be doing what we wanted to do, as the Scripture says, on the Lord's Day. We determined that we would dedicate, no matter how much was involved, and if you can't, please don't take this as a negative, because I'm not trying to do a negative, I'm just saying what we decided. In the most testing and trying times when I really needed to go and do stuff on a Sunday, we determined that Sunday was consecrated, separated and set aside for God. When I was farming and under a lot of pressure uh, to work longer hours, more days, don't even stop, we determined that this day, no matter what happened, we were going to church. Cyclones came, flattened our crops and we went to church. You know that God resurrected our crops? Yeah, long sto- another story for another day. But God, three days later, stood the whole crop up, five metres tall, corn that was flat on the ground. God said, don't go in the paddocks, don't look at anything, just go to church and worship me. And we went to church and worshiped and three days, as the Lord said, after three days, go. And the people around our fields, they said, do you know what happened to your crops? No, they were flat on the ground. And now that I'm there, they're standing straight. We got the record yield, we broke records that year on the yield. And I believe it's because we worship God. Didn't go crying over the spilt milk, the damage that was done, but we kept following God. So our first fruits, you know, consecrate to me all the firstborn, Exodus 13 verse two, consecrate the firstborn. Whoever opens a womb among the children of Israel, the both man and beast, God says it's mine. Consecrate it. You know, it, in Exodus 13, 13, unusual thing. I wanted you to hear this, pick it up in the spirit, what it means. It's an Old Testament verse. But every firstborn donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. In other words, the firstborn, everything to do with first. Whoever comes first is not your choice. But in the Old Testament, you know, there were clean and unclean animals. And God says, the first lamb of the, of the flock, it's mine. In other words, you give it to the kingdom of God. You give it to the house of God. It's part of your reasonable service. But a donkey was considered unclean. So the way that the firstborn donkey could be kept was to give a lamb in its place. You, you couldn't because it was unclean. And if you will not redeem it, if you cannot or will not give a lamb, then break its neck. It can't live. It's going to die. It speaks of the sinful soul will die. And without the blood of Jesus washing and cleansing us, we're all destined for a lost eternity in the place of the Word of God. Jesus describes heaven. He describes hell. Jesus spoke about both of those places. And He said, it's not the will of God that any should perish, but that everybody should come to the knowledge of God. Repent and be saved. Be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Be filled with the Spirit. Live by the Word. Jesus, the Lamb of God, with no sinful nature, God gave Jesus, who is clean, first for us. As an un- for, for us, He gave the clean Lamb of God, 
for us, the human population, have got, that have got rebellion, me, my, I, and self, and greed built into us, the donkey, in other words, the lamb died for all of us, that we could be redeemed, and the donkey could be redeemed, we could be redeemed, but not by us dying, not by the donkey dying, but by the fact that the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, He came and died for us. Hallelujah. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Put God first in everything in your life. Faith, it takes faith to give first, whether it's to a neighbour, a friend, a family member, a car. We've had people in the house who've given away cars. You know, I know there's going to be more cars given away in this house. Cars. Not the rubbish. Un- you know, it needs about $20,000 to fix it. Is that light? You know? No. A, a car that's in good working order. I feel that God told me to give this car to you. And it's actually giving and receiving and the kingdom begins to flow like a mighty current, a river that cannot be stopped. Hallelujah. The only time in Scripture that He actually gives us the opportunity to test, try, prove Him with what we do according to the Word of God is in our giving. We've all experienced, everyone in this room has been in that place of the land of not enough, the place of the bag. Judas, Judas was no different to all of us, just that he never allowed the work to happen. If he'd allowed the work, his greed was take, take, take out of the bag he was a thief from the beginning but we've all been to where that is you know according to scripture there's nobody in this room who hasn't been a thief at some time no matter how small or how big the thieving was thieves are still thieves yeah so Judas ended up in the wrong place because he never moved from that place the bag never ever didn't move from it not enough never enough You know, I'm not going to give because I haven't got enough. I'm never going to have enough. Uh, You know, what if all the bad things that I think could happen, happen? They say statistically, most of the things we worry about and lose sleep over never happen. But the enemy uses it with fear, the spirit of fear to rob you. And you fear, continually fear, fear, fear of what could happen. The biggest commitment of our year, you know, for us, we're in the process right now of refreshing our increase every year we have been giving to our building fund we we determine at the beginning of the year because what we do at the beginning sets the pattern for the year and certainly within the next few days or week we will have finalized prayerfully our increase we have asked God help us to increase every year and that's part of what we do but it's offerings and missions offerings and whatever else in our tithes though all of those things are part and parcel of who we are what we do Praise God. So, at, you know, put God first. That, this message is simply called first. There is some I've heard it said by different ministers at different times. You know, uh, if Jesus isn't Lord of all, then He's not Lord at all. You got that? In other words, He wants total control, submission from me to Him lovingly. Not like robots, not like, you know... Uh, Artificial intelligence. He doesn't want that. He wants a loving relationship. And, but he wants a yield that, he, that we understand that he knows more than all of us put together. And he only wants good for me if I will only listen. That's actually what he's looking for. Hallelujah. You know, this morning, if this message resonates, I'm not going to ask anyone to come to the front. But if it resonates in your heart, I want to. I just want to pray for all of us together, corporately. Somewhere that God teaches you, teaches me how to live even more for Him and putting Him first. Will you stand today? If you feel in your heart you want to, I'm not going to pressure you. I'm just ask, inviting today. If you want prayer today, you want to live with God first in your life, not second. Stand to your feet. We're going to pray.
Wonderful Lord. Father, I pray. Lord, your people in this house. Lord, today they've come around the Word of God. And Father, your Word is powerful, energised and effective. It's truth. And Lord, if your Word is truth, then it always will bear good fruit in every, every heart and every life. Father, I pray that the veil over the eyes, over the ears, Lord, the eyes, unveil eyes today, that they can truly see, not with their natural eyes, but the eyes of the Spirit. Unveil the, the ears of the Spirit, where a human being, He is God, communicates. He is the communication from heaven. Unveil our minds and give us the mind of Christ today. Unveil our hearts. Hallelujah. Our hearts, O oh God, let our hearts be unveiled because that is the seat of revelation and enthroning the Lordship of Christ. Let Jesus be Lord of all. Let Jesus be enthroned in every heart and every life that is open today to receive from you the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Father, today, Lord, you told me to do this. And Father, I just want to, if you today are a reaper, if you're still seated and you say, I'm going to win people to God, I want to do something today. I want to bless the reapers. Hallelujah. And then you can worship God from that. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless the reapers. Lord, bless the reapers that they go out with full energy, putting you first and this kingdom and lives that could be and should be brought into the kingdom of God, even into this house, O oh God. I bless the reapers. I bless the evangelists. I bless those that go and preach the gospel to the lost and the perishing. I bless their ways today. I bless their houses. I bless their income. I bless their spouses. I bless their children. I bless their minds. I bless their, their strategies, O oh God. I bless their plans today. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Hallelujah. Happy New Year and thank you for joining us here on the Royals YouTube channel. We are so blessed to have you on this journey with us and trust that our weekly content is enriching and enlightening you for the year ahead. Let's stay connected and don't forget to subscribe. We are looking forward to seeing you soon for another glorious gathering.